Recording in progress. Good morning, everyone. So I hope you had a nice break uh, and time back uh, to go back to work. Um, so we continue our study of geodesics in Schwarzschild. And um, maybe there is a, a parenthesis concerning constants of motions, which uh, um, has to do with uh, killing vectors. Uh, this is something that you have seen in the Übungen way back, so I've suddenly forgotten about it. So uh, let me remind you how this goes. Um, so this is constants of motion for geodesics. And this has to do with something called killing vectors. Uh, so the definition may be a killing vector. Uh, X is a killing vector field. Uh, let me call this KV. Uh, KV uh, field if uh, it satisfies this equation and so this is uh, just the definition. Now this has to do with uh, isometries and we're going to come back to this later uh, when looking at the definition of the lead derivative. But uh, let me just ignore this for the moment uh, and uh, say that, uh, well, this is a definition. An example uh, would be uh, x uh, is dt uh, or x is d over d phi in Schwarzschild. Uh, well, the, the, the easy justification that this equation is satisfied um, for these fields uh, would be just using the fact that these vector fields generate isometries. Uh, in other words, the metric does not depend upon t. That's the same as saying that this vector generates isometries. And the metric does not depend, the Schwarzschild metric does not depend upon phi. That's, again, another way of saying that this, uh, well, this has to do with isometries. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's difficult to show uh, directly that this is true. Uh, so maybe, uh, 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 let me leave it as an exercise, right? So exercise check, check one. Uh, maybe it's easy, but I haven't prepared this, so maybe it's going to turn up to be a mess. And uh, uh, if you look at the definition using the Christoffels, so. Uh, so that's an example. And I mean, the point here is that uh, if uh, X is a KV, and uh, gamma is a geodesic, then uh, the scalar product of gamma dot with x is constant along gamma. Uh, so again, maybe this is something that you had in the Übungen, but uh, uh, I may rather that's an important fact, so, so let's uh, emphasize this. And the proof is uh, not very difficult. 
uh, so let's see. So we let's think of uh, gamma as being a function of s, and we calculate d over ds of the scalar product of gamma dot and uh, x. In other words, it is the same as calculating the covariant derivative in the direction of alpha of uh, gamma dot beta x beta. Well, this is a scalar, so I could have written a partial derivative here, but uh, for a scalar, partial and, uh, and covariant is the same. But now the covariant derivative satisfies the chain rule, so we have two terms, gamma alpha d alpha gamma dot beta x beta, and this is zero because gamma is a geodesic. And there's another term, so we calculate uh, there'll be a second term which is gamma dot alpha gamma dot beta d alpha x beta. And this is zero now because this is symmetric. So I can write it, might as well write it as uh, in a funny way. Well, I split it into two terms, and because this is symmetric, I can add the same thing with indices interchanged. So, uh, but this is zero by one. Okay, so this is the calculation, and now you can't see what I wrote here, so... Uh, hmm. I should have checked the settings of the blackboard before. Apologize. Good. So that's, that's the proof. So the scalar product for a Keeling vector is constant along uh, geodesics. Um, I was trying to think whether it's going to be an easy exercise to, to check that. Well, uh, let me just not do it. I mean, it, it is probably not very difficult, but good. So, so, in, so if we take these two killing vectors and we take the scalar product of the tangent to any geodesic with the skinning vector, uh, we're going to get zero, okay? Constant, uh, constant, a constant along the geodesic, not zero, but the derivative is zero, so the thing is constant along the geodesic. And so uh, this, uh, this is at the basis of our uh, two constant of motion for, uh, for geodesic in Schwarzschild, the energy E and the angular momentum J. So that's uh, one way to think about it, and that's the way I think about it. We've derived this constant of motion from the Lagrangian, right? So that was, that's another way of doing this, uh, but, uh, but uh, one way of thinking about this constant of motion is exactly this um, story with killing vectors. If I start going too low on the uh, board, please shout so that uh, you can see what I'm doing. So this is the end of the parentheses.
And we return to our geodesics in Schwarzschild. So as, as usual, I will need a, a little help, help from the audience with the numbering. We're starting a new section, so you have to tell me which number we're doing now. For once, maybe somebody else than Eva can tell me what is the number of the section we're doing. Say it again. 412. 412. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Okay. Thanks. So uh, 412, uh, so interpretation of E. Uh, I've already used the name energy, so uh, let's see how this, what this has to do with the energy. So, uh, so now E was minus the scalar product of the uh, tangent to a geodesic and the killing vector dt. Um, yeah, so this is a geodesic. So we know just by the argument we just get, went through, or from our Lagrangian thinking that this is a constant along the geodesic. So uh, well, we're taking the Schwarzschild metric. So. Uh, I'm wondering if I should write it, but let me just write it again. Minus dt squared plus So I take the scalar product with dt. There's only v which comes in with a minus. Cancel this minus. I get v dt over ds. And, uh, and so the question is, uh, what is E? How should we understand it? Uh, now, uh, there is something from special relativity uh, that uh, we need to remember that if you have uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, unit, well, Two four velocities, say right, two four velocities, if you if you v are two four velocities. So four velocities being time like perhaps future directed uh, unit vector, then gamma, which is the minus the scalar product, is the uh, relative gamma factor. 
right? So relative gamma factor. Uh, so gamma is uh, one over. Aha, and we have, of course, now a clash of notation with the geodesic and the gamma factor, ay, ay, ay. Okay, so we shouldn't call gamma a geodesic. Uh, I, I've called geodesics gamma all my life. Oh, let's, let, let's put uh, an x dot here. Uh, so, so, so that would be uh, 1 over 1 minus uh, v square over c square over 1 over v square, uh, where uh, v is the relative space velocity, right? Relative velocity. Well, if I put the Minkowski metric here, that would be obvious. That's uh, what we did in special relativity for several months. Uh, but then we use this principle that uh, we can carry over notions from special relativity to general relativity using normal coordinates. So in normal coordinates, this would be true, uh, uh, or local inertial frames, if you prefer. But then in local inertial frame, g and eta are the same. So good. So uh, so now uh, so that's. Uh, a, a fact in special relativity. And uh, we're going to take uh, uh, one thing would be u is the uh, full velocity of stationary observers, of static observers. So static observers have a uh, tangent uh, d over dt. And uh, we have to uh, normalize it so that it has uh, unit lengths. So to have this normalized, we need a square root of v. And of course, r should be larger than 2m for this. Otherwise, square root of v would be negative. Or, or zero. Uh, <laughs> of course not. To minus one, right? To minus one. You know, let me check this because uh, if I wrote it wrong, so so I would just write u is u naught dt. Then the g of uh, u u should be minus one. Uh, then this is g of uh, u zero dt u0 dt, which is u0 square g dt. Right? If I can factor out the u0, and I'm left with g dt, so this is minus v u0 square, and that's my formula. Good. So, so we take u, this four velocity of static observers, and uh, v we're going to take x dot, right? So tangent, uh, where uh, where x uh, is um, a proper time parameterized time like geodesic. Just wondering if in the in this section of the lecture notes, uh, I also have this clash of notation of uh, uh, gamma being uh, geodesic and uh, and uh, this gamma factor. Uh, so uh, if someone is actually having my notes in front of him and checking, then please send me an email to confirm that I need to correct this. 
And more generally, if you find any typos or misprints or uh, omissions, wrong statements or anything like that in the lecture notes, uh, so in my book, I would be very grateful for sending him an email mentioning that this needs correcting because there might be a different edition at some stage. So I would like to correct any sad things there. Uh, I already know there are plenty because I'm checking as, as we go, uh, but maybe there are some which I overlooked, so I'd be very grateful for any such things. Anyway, so, so, we, we want to, so, so we have this gamma factor. We're taking this uh, u is equal 1 over square root of v dt and taking the scalar product with the tangent to the geodesic. No? No. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, good. So, uh, so with these choices that I told you, uh, the gamma factor is therefore uh, minus the scalar product of x dot uh, and the unit vector here, which is not dt, but uh, my vector u, which is then g x dot and uh, u being 1 over square root v dt. So this is minus g uh, x dot dt divided by square root v. And, but this is my energy here. Okay, so this is the energy uh, divided by square root v. Well, or this constant e. So we get that E is square root of V times the gamma factor, which is a square root of 1 minus 2m over R uh, divided by 1 minus V square. And of course, this gamma factor here is the special relativistic energy for a particle of mass 1. So this already has a feeling of energy, but uh, let's just have a look at uh, what it gives for small distances, uh, for large distances and small velocities. 
and large R. So this is R, this is the velocity. So let's see, if I expand the square root, square root 1 plus x is something like that. So it's going to be 1 minus m over r. And uh, if I expand, well, I have a, a 1. I can do this expansion for square root 1 of a minus v square, but remembering that this is uh, in the numerator denominator. Uh, sorry, in the denominator, you have to change the sign. Uh, right, so this 1 minus m over r is coming from an expansion of the square root. And And because this is square root 1, 1, I mean v square is 1 plus 1 half v square, but because it was down with a minus sign, it becomes a plus up, so which is therefore uh, 1 plus 1 half v square minus m over r. And because everything is small, then I just neglect these things. So uh, if uh, the geodesic corresponds to a mass m naught, so you think, well, there's an object moving on a time-like geodesic with rest mass m naught, then we're going to get that E m naught is m naught plus m naught v square over 2 minus m naught m over r, which is the Newtonian kinetic. and which is the Newtonian potential energy. So, this is at large distances and small velocities. At large distances and large velocities, uh, you're going to get, well, the rest energy uh, plus the Newtonian kinetic energy shifted by a gamma factor. So that's a usual gamma factor uh, multiplication of energy. So in other words, this is the justification that this should be thought of really as the energy, right? So this we think of the energy, if you think about this N object moving, having mass m naught, then E is, uh, E m naught is the energy, so E is energy per unit mass. So this is uh, how we should understand the the constant E. Good. So this closes this section for 12. Uh, the constant J for geodesics is the obvious interpretation of angular momentum. And uh, let's see what else we can say about these geodesics, right? So you have already seen the redshift effect in this Schwarzschild field. Uh, there is another important effect, which is called the Shapiro effect, which I want to 
discuss with you now. So uh, I think it's uh, 19 now, is it? Uh, 13, right? 13? Okay. Why, why did I think 19? Are we the May 18 today? Or oh, it's 17 now? Okay. <laughs> so 13, and this is the Shapiro effect. So, um, I know. <laughs> That's, thank you for telling me that I know. <laughs> Good. So, this is the Shapiro effect uh, at work. So, in this... Uh, Uh, is it left, right? It's left, right? So in this left window, you have a source of light situated in this quarter, corner, and it's in Minkowski space-time. So you're sending light, and light goes along straight lines. Uh, here, uh, you have... Just get rid of this. Uh, in the right, you have the same uh, source of light, except that now uh, this source of light is in uh, Schwarzschild space-time. So you're sitting here, you have your favorite flashlight, you send light rays, then now there is a Schwarzschild uh, black hole sitting here at the center. So here, light rays were going along straight lines, here they're curved, right? So the one which goes straight away, keeps going straight away and vanishes out of sight. And the one which was going out there would be slightly bent and uh, by, by the geometry. Uh, there'll be some which are strongly bent. Uh, there are some which are bent so that they come back and fall into this gray region. In fact, uh, on this picture you don't have all possibilities, but there are, uh, if you think about it, obviously if there are some which uh, come back and fall in the gray region, uh, and some go to infinity, there must be one which goes back to yourself. So there exists something called boomerang orbits, which uh, go and come back to, to you, they're not shown in this region. There are even light uh, orbits which are boomerangs uh, uh, with a twist, so they circle several times around uh, this uh, center before coming back to you. 
Now, what do you think that this uh, gray area is? Right, so the, 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 the light rays, uh, somehow in this picture, they seem that they just vanish. Uh, we don't see. The ones that don't hit the gray area uh, just remain outside, but those that hit the gray area just stop existing. So, of course, uh, well, the obvious thing that you're tempted to say it and you're going to say because you know that there is a catch is that this uh, gray area uh, should have radius 2m, should be the event horizon. Well, it's wrong. The radius of this uh, uh, gray area is 3m. So uh, we're going to, to figure this out uh, very shortly in the calculations. So in other words, when you have a light ray which comes from uh, outside of the black hole, and gets closer than 3m uh, in terms of the uh, Schwarzschild coordinate r, then it's not going to come back out again in the asymptotic region. And this is called the, the shadow of a black hole. So the shadow of a black hole is effectively uh, that uh, uh, a region which in Schwarzschild coordinates has radius 3m. Uh, and it's larger than the horizon itself. So, uh, so, so, oh, but I wanted to tell you about the Shapiro effect, right? And I haven't. And what is the Shapiro effect? So, so see, you, you see this front, uh, this wave front propagating. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, in, the, in the left picture, that's the, how it propagates in um, Minkowski spacetime. And here, see, in, in the right picture, you're saying that this, you're seeing that at a, uh, any moment of time, and I'm, unfortunately I cannot stop this video, so I mean this is a GIF picture, not a video, so there are no controls involved, but it kind of gets retarded compared to its uh, Minkowskian friend, right? So the light front at a given point, if you want to uh, reach this point here, uh, the equivalent point in Minkowski space-time would be reached faster by light than it does in Schwarzschild. And this is the Shapiro delay, right? The light, uh, when reaching a point, if you're sitting at a point and trying to, see, to, uh, to measure the time a light needs to go from one point to another, then the time in um, Schwarzschild, uh, the light ray will come back to you later than it did in Minkowski spacetime. So that's the delay. Uh, so let's see how one calculates this. Uh, well, and Shapiro, uh, Mr. Shapiro, uh, said the following. Uh, suppose that uh, I have uh, uh, the Earth sitting here. Well, let this be the Sun. And we have the Earth uh, sitting at R, uh, say, B. And we have Venus sitting here. Is Venus uh, closer to the Sun or further away? Closer. Closer. Okay, good. So that's the right picture. And so we send a radar signal. Uh, 
and uh, we uh, let it bounce back and we wait and measure the time uh, that this signal would need to go, uh, that it needs to go back and forth, right? So time uh, at B. Uh, how much time does, will it take for a light ray to travel back and forth? Now, so light rays are null geodesics, right? So light rays in this situation. Of course, the, what Shapiro did, well, Shapiro measured this and uh, found agreement with general relativity, and that's why it's called Shapiro effect. And uh, of course, he didn't do it in the simple configuration that I have here, that to have radial geodesic, but he had a, uh, he was looking at how this time changes when Venus moves and so forth. So the calculation that he needed to do was a little more complicated than what we're going to do, but we're just going to uh, do the calculation for the simplest uh, uh, configuration and find indeed that the time for uh, this signal to go back and forth uh, is uh, larger in Schwarzschild than in Minkowski spacetime. So, so we're sending light rays. Uh, if you think about the spacetime picture, then this is uh, RB, RA, and we're sending a light ray to here and let it bounce here. And that would be the Minkowski space picture now. Uh, in, in uh, Schwarzschild, these light rays will be curved, but the uh, conceptual picture is the same. So uh, we need to uh, calculate this time. Now, when a light ray is a, a, a null geodesic, here, a null radial geodesic, So I could take my radial geodesic equation, but I just can use the fact that uh, 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 that g on uh, the tangent is uh, is zero. So this is uh, minus v uh, dt over ds square plus uh, dr over ds square one over v. It's radial, so there is no uh, angular. Uh, things. In other words, I can calculate, I want t, right? So uh, this is a calculation we already did for um, for the redshift effect. Uh, let's see, how does this go? Uh, so there'll be, uh, if I put it on the, on this side, I need to divide by v. Uh, so I divide by v, I get a v square, take a square root, this is this, right? So uh, I have a trip time here, which is uh, so t1 and t2. t2. Uh, so it, which is the same as uh, dt over dr. So T1, I'm integrating from RB to RA. And uh, we, you have to use the negative sign, so minus dr over V. And T2 will be integral from RA to RB, but now with the plus sign dr over v. Now if I change the order of integration here, I get this is the same as ra over rb, and this takes care of the sign. Uh, so 
t at b is the sum of these two. But they're the same. So twice integral of Ra of Rb uh, dr over v. Well, I could calculate this integral. That, that's doable. That's not uh, very exciting. Uh, what we uh, really want to show that uh, Tb in Schwarzschild is louder than um, Tb in Minkowski. And uh, if you just integrate explicitly, this is not clear. Well, actually, you don't want Tb in Schwarzschild. You want the proper time, right? As B is the proper time at B. So we need to, uh, and we need to show that the proper time is larger, right? So, so from this one, we'll get a formula, but uh, if you want, you can integrate it, but uh, it's not going to be completely obvious that this proper time is larger than Minkowskian one. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's try to, uh, to, to look at this proper time. Now remember that, uh, how do I need the proper time? Uh, well, dx over ds is uh, u mu is, uh, so um, the velocity vector, which we had here, and it was 1 over square root of v, if I remember, uh, it's correctly delta mu t, right? So the full velocity for static observer so we're taking static observers here. Uh, that's his word line, right? So in other words, uh, dt over ds is uh, 1 over square root of v. And uh, since uh, r is constant, we can calculate uh, from this that s, uh, so ds is square root of v dt. I hope I have it uh, right. And so by integration, s is square root of v times t. So in other words, if we use this formula here, we're going to get that this is square root of v at rb, right? So let me just write immediately the formula. I'm a little worried now because it doesn't uh, look like the formula I had in, uh, when preparing the lecture today, but so I obviously made a mistake uh, when doing this, but uh, let's see, I hope it's still going to work. So, uh, so this is uh, 2 times 1 minus 2m over Rb uh, integral from Ra to Rb 1 over 1 minus 2m over r dr. Good. So this is a formula that we get. Uh, it's easy to calculate when m is 0, right? So if m equals 0, we get the obvious uh, thing. Uh, right? So this will then if m is 0, then this is 1. We get twice the difference of the radial coordinates. Uh, and the question is, is this thing louder than 1 or smaller than 1? Uh, Sb of m not equal 0 is larger or is it smaller than Sb on m equals 0. Well, so I have to go back to work and start erasing. And meanwhile, you can try to 
see if you can find a simple argument here. I, I know one which is relatively simple, but uh, I'd be happy to see a simpler one. I know it's disgusting here, but uh, it's too much work to copy this, so let me just leave it like that. And I'll try better on the next board. Good. So uh, anyone has a simple uh, argument? that this is uh, as b is larger than 2 or b minus r, a. I assume we're talking about strictly positive mass and not just mass that's not managing. Very good. <laughs> uh, Schwarzschild, when I'm talking about Schwarzschild, yeah. always um, positive. In that case, we can just estimate the pre-factor from below by putting it into the integral and replacing the r b with an r because that's monotonously increasing. Okay, so you're saying that 1 minus 2m over r b is larger than 1 minus 2m over r? That's what you're, what you're saying? Yeah, once from the integral, of course. Right, yeah. Uh, is this clear? So let's see. Uh, so... <laughs> r is smaller than rb, then 1 over r is larger than 1 over rb, then minus 2m over r is larger than minus 2m over rb. Smaller, larger? Uh, smaller now, right? Smaller. Okay. Uh -huh. Smaller, and so... Uh, this is, and, and square root is monotonous, okay. So we get this one, good. So we put this in the integral, so we say that Sb is larger than the integral of Ra to Rb. So if I put it in, I get, I'm left with a square root here. And, the, and then the, this is larger than 1. Right, right. Uh -huh. Because 1 minus 2m of r is smaller than 1. Square root is still smaller than 1. 1 over something smaller is larger. So, uh, right. Uh, so it's larger than, uh, yeah, integral of 1, which is tw uh, twice rb minus r. Okay. So this is the Shapiro delay. Um, as I was presenting this to you, I was wondering whether there is a mistake here, maybe. Uh, 
having to do with the location of the object, right? Because uh, when we are comparing these things, RB, RA, so uh, RA was the Schwarzschildian location of Venus, right? And this is and this is our uh, our position, and this is Venus. And RA should be the position where Ven Venus is at a given moment of time. And uh, the question is, if we start changing the metric, is this uh, maybe RA should change or something like that, right? Because, for example, if I start changing the metric, uh, I'm ch ch changing distances. So space distances uh, between uh, these two points in Schwarzschild and in Minkowski will not be the same. Maybe if you want to compare, you want to then adjust the position of Venus so that the space distance is the same. So I, I let you brood over it. I think that uh, there is a geometric problem here. Where, where should Venus be if you start comparing two metrics, right? So you have two, two space-time. One is Minkowski, the other is Schwarzschild, and you have two points in Minkowski, two points in Schwarzschild. You want to compare them? Is there a natural way? Here we've just said we're taking the same coordinate. But uh, so I don't think there is a natural way, but the fact that we're sending a ray and moving it back is actually takes care of this ambiguity. So in other words, the fact that we're sending rays back and forth and comparing distances in uh, by, by using the same coordinates is probably the right thing to do, but I'm not completely sure. So I let you brood about it. Uh, but in any case, this calculation shows you explicitly that if Schwarzschild, if you're sending light rays in this setup, then you're going to get a, a delay. And this is uh, the contents of this video I showed you, uh, or, or this GIF file that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. Good. So this was a Shapiro delay. And um, as I said, confirmed uh, experimentally by Mr. Shapiro by uh, sending uh, X-rays, um, uh, well, radar actually, not, not X-rays, ra radar rays to Venus. <laughs> the way it worked is that uh, uh, the U.S. Army had this uh, huge uh, uh, radar device uh, which became obsolete because they needed better ones. And uh, he said, wait a minute, do you think I could use this thing for a, a, a couple of months before you just shut it down? And they let him do it. Uh, and, and he got uh, confirmation. Now, uh, much better confirmations have been meanwhile obtained uh, using uh, uh, spacecraft. In particular, uh, the latest one, I think, was the Cassini uh, spacecraft. Uh, do I remember correctly that Cassini was supposed to fly to Ju Jupiter or something like that? And then uh, get lost outside of the solar system? Was it the idea? Anyone knows? Well, in any case, there is this Cassini uh, spacecraft which went much, much further than, um, than, of, than the distance uh, Venus Earth, and, uh, and we're communicating with it all the time because we wanted to make sure that it goes where we want it to go. Someone had a very good uh, information about travel times back and forth, and uh, by analyzing these travel times, one could just confirm 
the Shapiro effect to uh, one part better than one part in, in, in 10,000, right? So uh, error smaller than 10 to minus 4, relative error smaller than 10 to minus 4. So quite a decent uh, confirmation. So, uh, this was uh, the equation we derived for uh, geodesics. Uh, so, we're doing 14 now. And solutions of this equation tend to be, of course, quite complicated. Uh, in particular, it's not at all obvious what these things will do. Now, we expect that general relativity has something to do. It's 14 now, is it? Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that general relativity has something to do uh, with Newton theory as well. So there should be, uh, and in Newton theory, there are uh, orbits of planets which have a constant radius. So uh, what we're going to do now is try to uh, have a look at the geodesics uh, which have constant radius. Whether there are some, and we need, we'll find that there are some, and we'll try to analyze them. So, that would look good here. Now, what is interesting uh, is uh, that, uh, that there are also uh, null geodesics which are circular, right? So you, have a, you can have a light rays which stay on a circle. That's probably the most interesting conclusion of what I'm going to do now. But so let's... Uh, Uh, let's see how this goes. So, uh, circular. Can you see this? Probably not. Uh, why do I have this uh, Bildungsministerium? Well, what, has this been on all the time? This is new, right? I don't think... and the University of Vienna. I don't like this. Huh. And may maybe that's on from the AT lecture. Okay. I mean, it's okay. I, 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 I'm not shocked by this. In fact, actually, it's cute. But, uh, well, it takes room. So, uh, so circular geodesics. And you can still read this, right? Uh, geodesics. Uh, okay, what's the best way to go uh, for this? Um, now let's let's uh, let's take this equation. Uh, there's another equation which goes with this, which I need uh, and which I don't uh, remember offhand. There was the conservation of energy, which is associated with this. Maybe we should be able to, to figure this out. 
so so let's see and uh, yeah because this is the derivative of the potential right uh, so so we will have a formula which says that uh, and so now I'm going to get the factors wrong going right? let's leave dangerously uh, so if I integrate this uh, okay so I multiply this by du over d phi uh, and integrate uh, then I'm going to get uh, by integrating this one half of uh, du over d phi square. Can you still uh, see this very well? Good. And from the right hand side, I'm going to get uh, uh, minus minus u square. I'm going to get the, 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 the coefficients wrong, probably, right? <laughs> hmm. Okay, uh, let me just... Uh, if I take this equation, right? One half du over d phi square is equal a function of phi. Uh, one option would be that I spend five minutes now looking for the right formula or somebody tells me what is the uh, integral of motion for this equation, right? So maybe that would be the, the simplest way, but uh, otherwise, since I've forgotten, I multiply by d over d phi. So if I take the equation plus f of phi and I differentiate it, I'm going to get uh, du over d phi times d to u over d phi square is equal d, this is f of u. Uh, d u over d phi f prime. So this is f prime, right? Okay. So f is, I integrate minus u, so this is going to be a constant, which, I, which is not the same constant as before, so uh, called e minus uh, u square over 2 plus 3u square over uh, u cube. plus u cube over uh, that's u cube, right? Is this? I have to integrate this with you, please, so please, uh, in you, so please help me. <laughs> yeah, you just do uh, cube. u cube, right? u cube plus lambda m square over j square u and plus a constant, right? Okay. And so this is a one half du over d phi square. So, so, so let's see, so, so let this one be equation one and this is going to be equation two. And we want uh, geodesics with uh, r equal constant, which is the same as dr over d phi is equal zero. And of course, uh, uh, which is the same as uh, u was m over r, uh, so u is constant, and uh, which is the same as du over d phi is zero. So from one, we get, well, obviously, second derivatives are zero as well. Then we get zero is equal, uh, uh, let's see how I'm going to write this, minus u plus 3u square plus lambda 
m square j square. And now lambda is uh, either 0 or 1 if we're interested in null geodesics or time-like. So, uh, somehow it should be clear that this has a sign or something like that. Uh, if you are in the region, uh, so let's see, so this is, uh, if I factor out u, I get 3u minus 1 plus lambda m square over j square. So that's one equation. And let's see if uh, lambda is equal to 0, which is the case of no geodesics, I get either u equals 0, which is irrelevant because u is m over r, right? So that would be at infinity, so that's not very interesting. But then, or I get that u is one third. And u is uh, m over r. So which is the same as r equal 3m. So as I said, there exist uh, circular null geodesics. and uh, sitting at r equal 3m. So you have your black hole here. So that would be r equal 2m would be the event horizon and at 3m this light which goes in circles. And I'm going to show you shortly that this uh, corresponds to the shadow region. So in other words, if you're shining light on a black hole, uh, once it crosses this region 3M, it cannot escape. That's uh, uh, the shadow picture. Good. Now, um, we're going to do the time-like ones. And I'm just wondering how much time I have now, 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, so let's see. So we'll need this equation here. Uh, now with lambda equal 1. Uh, so let me copy this equation. So that's going to be equation 3, which is u, 3u minus 1 is equal minus, well, so minus lambda m square over j square. And this equation 2, which was uh, du over d phi uh, is 0. So let me call this 4 then. Uh, e minus u square over 2 plus u cube plus lambda m square g square u. Then this is 0. Uh, good. So now this can go. I'm uh, living very dangerously here because when I was preparing this, or if you look at the lecture notes, it, everything is done in the terms of the variable r. But since I started using the variable, variable r, uh, u here, I thought, well, let me 
continue because there's no reason not to use the variable u for this. In fact, I think that some of the arguments are a little simpler, but that I've never done this <laughs> like that. So maybe it's going to be a complete disaster. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So be ready for the worst. And you can always uh, look it up in the book <laughs> where it's done in terms of the variable r. And normally it should be done relatively decently. Yes, so what else do we know about this geodesics? Well, we have the J is the angular momentum, and that was the scalar product of uh, x dot with the vector d over d phi. So in other words, r square uh, sine square theta uh, phi dot. And uh, this is 1 because we are on the equatorial plane. So uh, we get that phi dot is equal j over r square isn't constant because r is constant. We have the, the formula that e is equal uh, minus the scalar product of x dot dt. So in other words, v uh, dt over ds. Uh, and this is constant. So um, what do we get out of this? Uh, yeah, so that t is a linear function of s. Uh, so dt over ds is e over v is constant. So let's see, 3, 4, uh, 5, uh, 6. Uh, what else do we have? We have the lengths, right? So the lengths, uh, and the lengths is probably the same as this equation here, uh, but here the, this constant will be probably uh, more explicit. So uh, uh, g of x dot, x dot is minus 1, uh, which is minus v dt over ds square plus dr over ds square 1 over v plus r square. Theta is constant, so I, didn't see, so I get d phi over ds square is minus 1. Um, then uh, if I put this here, dt over ds, so e square over v square, that I'm going to get. Yeah, it's probably, I, I shouldn't have lost time trying to, to do this uh, formula here. So e square over v square. With the v, so I get uh, minus e square over v plus d over ds is 0. Uh, r square uh, j square over r square is equal minus 1. Uh, what 
doing here for, so r square like that which is telling me that uh, yes e square if I put it on this side have it right uh, e square over v from this this is zero this one and so uh, minus e square is equal minus v1 plus j square over r square so I can put the pluses here good so you give me r Uh, this equation 7, uh, 7 gives E. Um, 6 gives T of S, right? So gives T of S. Uh, 5 gives Um, phi of s and it looks like we should be done uh, except what haven't we uh, uh, satisfied right so uh, I think that this equation is uh, once you give you, you can always calculate this curly E. So this curly E, watch out, is not the same as the normal one. So this equation shouldn't be a problem, but can we satisfy this one, right? So does this one uh, impose new constraints? And uh, I think it does. And uh, how much time do I have for this? I have seven minutes. And <laughs> uh, so, so uh, as I said, I didn't do it this way, but let's try if this, uh, this works. This equation should be telling us that uh, right? So this is, uh, this is going to give us a relation between J Okay, I see, I see what's happening, right? So, uh, J, uh, right, 7 gives E, uh, 6 gives T of S, 5 gives phi, but we need, we, we need J, right? But we can calculate J from 1, right? Right, so with J from 1. Okay, so in principle, uh, this should work, but there should be a constraint because this has a sign, right? So uh, you need uh, since the right hand side is negative, you need u three u minus one is negative. Okay. So that's the only condition which, and everything will be fulfilled, right? Because the geodesic equation is, uh, was this equation, equation one, which is satisfy if this is true. So if you give me an R, you can calculate uh, J from this equation. You can calculate uh, e from this equation and so forth. Right? Uh, I realize that I did it wrong because, of course, you need uh, to calculate A, you need J, right? But J uh, should be coming here and, and here. Good. So that's the way to work. 
So the only thing to check is now uh, whether this equation, which I looks too simple for me, I think that this should be a third order equation. So uh, there's a good chance that I copied this one wrong or something like that. Can someone check whether I have this equation correct? Um, we, we've never used this one, so it doesn't really matter, right? We derived it, but we never used it so far. But did I copy this one correctly? Six, 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 six. No. Say it again. No, I'm just saying it seems to be correct for what we did in the but it, it is correct. It agrees with what we had right. Okay, good. Somehow I remembered third order, but okay, it's quadratic, so it's even easier. Good. So, so let's see. So now the condition comes from here, right? So for this to be satisfied, you need uh, you can calculate j out of it if this is negative, right? So once this is negative, you calculate j, you calculate e. Uh, and, and you're, you're done. So uh, we just need to uh, solve the difficult problem of what is the sign of, uh, of this polynomial. Okay. Right. So if u is uh, small, then this is certainly negative, right? u is small being r large, that's certainly negative. Uh, so this is okay. Uh, and Yeah, so of course, uh, so th th this condition is obvious, right? You want this negative since u is positive, then 3 minus 1 should be negative, then uh, r should be larger than 3m. Okay. So let's see. So this would be equation uh, eight or something like that. Uh, so since uh, u is m over r uh, is positive, then eight uh, is the same as three u minus one smaller than zero, three u smaller than one. <laughs> I'm a little s slow here. But uh, okay. So the conclusion uh, there exists a circular um, time like geodesics. for any r larger than 3m. So this region r equals 3m is actually uh, is actually uh, special because at r equals 3m you have this circular null geodesics and outside of it at every point you have circular um, Time like geodesics, so planetary orbits which are circular in this region. 
So there's an important question of stability of these orbits, and this is something that we're not going to do today, but uh, this is for the next lecture. And uh, any questions? Uh, I'm sorry for losing a little time with calculating this, which is correct, but irrelevant at this stage. It's actually going to be relevant uh, uh, when we're going to do, uh, to understand the shadow, but, um, okay, uh, of the black hole, but it wasn't really needed here. So, thanks a lot, and uh, see you uh, in a few days. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.